In this video, we'll look at the Blasius solution of the boundary layer equations. First, focus on the hydrodynamic solution, and then we'll look at the energy solution. The boundary layer equations are presented here, where we have the pressure gradient term appearing in the y-momentum equation, and, as we saw, when we wish to, to look at a flat plate boundary layer, there is no pressure gradient, and that pressure gradient term disappears. We saw we can convert this system of five partial differential equations into a system of two ordinary differential equations, one, a third order ordinary differential equation representing the hydrodynamic solution, and a second order and a second order ordinary differential equation representing the energy solution. We also came up with our boundary conditions, and we have these boundary conditions in the far field, far away from the plate, uh, that we'll have to deal with in making this solution. We'll start with focusing on the hydrodynamic solution, or this equation here. Now, ordinary differential, ordinary differential equations are incredibly straightforward to solve numerically. Most packages have very robust solvers in order to solve those ordinary differential equations. But typically, the solvers want a set of first-order ODEs to solve. They want each equation in the set expressed and solved for the derivative df dx is equal to some function. So what we're going to need to do is convert this third-order ordinary differential equation into a set of three ordinary differential equations. That's a very straightforward thing to do, and we'll do it by defining three functions, f0, f1, and f2. We'll start by saying that f0 is equal to f. f, of course, is our non-dimensional stream function. Now we want, to express it at our er, we want to express our system as derivatives, and so f prime of our function 0 is, of course, equal to f prime. So there's our first ordinary differential equation expressed as the derivative of our f0 is equal to something that we're looking for f1, then, we'll say, is equal to the derivative of our f0. And, of course, we know that the derivative of our f0 is f prime. We need to express this in terms of a derivative to solve it with our solvers, and so f prime of 1, then, is equal to f double prime, the second derivative of our non-dimensional stream function. We'll continue with this exact same pattern. We'll let f2 be, the deriv be equal to the derivative of our function f1 that we just determined. And our function of f1 is, of course, the second derivative of our stream function. And so we want the derivative of that. Now that's equal to the third derivative of f. Now here, fortunately, we have some information to close the system. f prime is something we're wanting to solve for. f double prime is something we're wanting to solve for. f triple prime is not in our list of variables here. But we can eliminate it by using the governing equation here. We can, of course, solve for f triple prime in terms of f, f double prime, and this function too. And f triple prime, of course, is going to be minus f, f double prime divided by 2. And so now I have a system of equations that I can easily solve in order to determine the variables that I want, f, f prime, and f double prime. So there's our system expressed the way the solvers want it. Each one is the derivative of a different function uh, being equal to something that we're looking for that's part of our solution. We'll need three boundary conditions, one for each of these equations, and of course we know that our stream function, f0, is equal to f. Our stream function on the surface is equal to zero. There's no flow on the surface. So our initial condition, or f0 of zero, is equal to zero from that condition. We know that f1, f prime, is our non-dimensional velocity profile. We know that the velocity is zero on the surface, and so we know that f1 of zero is equal to zero. And we know that f1, the non-dimensional velocity profile, far away from the plate, is equal to 1. Now that is a, is, a is a boundary condition that we're going to have to do some work on, uh, because in order to use the solvers, they're going to use Runge-Kutta methods in order to integrate these equations and give us the final solutions, and they want to integrate from the initial conditions, or the f prime of 0. So what we really need to know is what is f2 uh, at zero in order to solve this. So we'll have to do a little bit of work to get that. But there's our set of equations and there's three boundary conditions and let's look at how we can implement this. This is this is a function in Python that implements this Blasius solution. I've called it Blas. And f is three vectors. f is a matrix of three columns. One each one of each column for f, f prime, and f double prime. And t is will be our eta parameter, the distance away from our surface. And so if I want to implement this equation, I can clearly see I need to implement this the way it's expected by these solvers, where each term, each equation, is the, each, each one is the derivative of an expression that we're looking for. So my first column is wanting this expression here. The derivative of f prime 0 is my f prime. Well, f prime is my f1 function. So f1 in the first uh, column of this thing. My second function expresses the derivative, f1 prime is f double prime, 
and f double prime is of course my second one and so that is f2 and my f2 prime that i want to place here is minus one half f f double prime so that's minus one half times f which is my f zero and f double prime which is my f2 so this implements this set of equations in there and now we just need to deal with the initial conditions and so I don't know the value of f1 infinity, and I can't implement the f1 of infinity boundary condition. I'm going to use the built-in solver, ODE int, in order to integrate this using runge kutta techniques. So I will call the function that I've used here, blas, and I will give it the initial conditions on f0, f1, and f2. I know that f0 and f1 have initial conditions of 0. Those are my boundary conditions that I determined. But what I know is that f1 at infinity should be 1. But I need to put in a value of f2 of 0. So I'm just going to start by guessing f2 of 0 is equal to 0.1. And now I'm going to look at my solution. So the solution that comes back is f as a function of eta, f prime as a function of eta, and f double prime as a function of eta. f is my non-dimensional stream function. It should start from 0 and continue to increase as we go out to the edge of the boundary layer as there's more and more flow as I go farther away from the plate f prime is my non-dimensional velocity distribution. That needs to start at 0 on the surface, and it should go out to a value of 1. Well, now it does not go out to a value of 1, and that's because I put a bad initial guess here. Uh, uh, sorry, a bad initial condition for f2. It doesn't respect this boundary condition that I want it to. So let me try a larger value. Let's increase that estimate of our f2 of 0 to be 0.2. Well, we see that stream function still behaves physically as it should, and the non-dimensional velocity profile, u over u prime, increases again. It's coming out further, almost to 0.75, but it doesn't come out to the value of 1, which I need it to. Well, if I use the value 0 0.0.332, now I see that my non-dimensional velocity profile starts at 0 as it must, and it reaches an awesome, it asymptotically approaches a value of 1 as I go away from uh, as I go away from the surface. And of course, this is u over u infinity. That needs to be 1, and it will need to be 1 as far away from the plate as we go because we're into the free stream conditions. So this is clearly a good solution for that u over u infinity. And now let's look at that f2. Our f2 is the second derivative of the stream function, or the derivative of the non-dimensional velocity profile. That is my shear, that is related to my shear stress. And so I see that that starts at a maximum value on the wall, and, of course, as we go far away, it approaches zero. There's no velocity gradient as we go far away from the plate, and so the, the quantity relating to the shear stress is approaching zero as we go far away. And so this looks like a very good solution, and of course, instead of guessing these numbers, I could have simply solved them. I can create a, another function that I can use a root solver. We've, seen, we've used f solve many times to find the roots of our nonlinear equations. And what I'm doing here is calling my initial conditions 0, 0, and x, and I'm writing my equation to be 1 minus the last value in my f1 function. Well, the last value in my f1 function should be 1, and so when I have the correct value of this initial condition, this is going to be 0, and I can use my root solver in order to find that 0. And of course, it turns out here that when I've used uh, solve for 8 is all the way up to 7, which is far enough away that we've reached the free stream conditions, that value is 0 0.332096. So we'll continue to use uh, this value to three significant digits uh, going forward. So there is our solution. We've already talked a little bit about each of these, the stream function, which increases as we move away. As we go further and further into the flow, we have more and more mass flow, more and more volume flow crossing this line as we move farther and farther away. And so it should increase and then approach a linear value. As we get far away, the velocity is u infinity, and so we'll increase the volume flow linearly as we keep going farther and farther away. That's exactly how that behaves. My non-dimensional velocity profile, we've talked about it should start at zero, the no-slip condition on the wall. And because it's non-dimensionalized by u infinity, it needs to go to one far away from the plate, and we know the shear stress is going to zero because far away we have no velocity gradients, and so this must uh, behave in this way, and correspondingly, the second derivative of f, the non-dimensional stream function, is a maximum on the wall where the wall shear stress is the highest. It's where we have the largest gradients in our profiles, and that approaches zero as we get far away where there's no gradients. So that's our solution. It's very interesting. It, we see that we do have a solution for a single value for all of these, and we have the scaling parameters in order to figure out how to get these values at any given location across our plate. Right? So let's look at that. We can start the first thing I want to look at is to think about the boundary layer thickness. We have that 
non-dimensional version of the non-dimensional velocity versus eta, and we typically define the edge of the boundary layer as that location where the velocity, u, is 99% of the free stream value. In this case, it's non-dimensionalized, so that's where my u over u infinity is equal to 0 0.99. I can quickly see that this is reaching 0 0.99 somewhere around here. We can be more precise with that. Uh, but it's clear from looking at this that this 0.99 value appears somewhere very close to an eta value of 5 being my similarity parameter, which was a scaling of that y-coordinate above the wall. If I look at this particular solution, I can see uh, that my f prime is equal to 0 0.991 at eta 4.95, and it's 5.02 at 0.992. So the answer is very close to an eta 5. We're going to pick that nice round number that's very close to our 99% of the free stream velocity, and now we can define the thickness of the boundary layer. Of course, our similarity parameter was defined in this way, and what we just saw that is at the edge of the boundary layer, that location where the velocity is 99% of the free stream value, or very close to it, eta is equal to 5. And the y location there is the edge of our boundary layer. So we put in 5 for the eta, and our y location is delta, our boundary layer thickness, and we have our scaling parameters there. Well, we can simplify this, or perhaps write this in a more interesting way, this is looking sort of like the Reynolds number. Okay, let's solve this for delta. Well, delta is then 5.0 over this quantity here, and we can simplify this even further. If I multiply this by x over x, I'm going to get a 5x here. I can bring this in as an x squared. It will cancel out with this x, and I'll have the square root of the Reynolds number here. And so the accepted equation for the thickness of the laminar boundary there is 5x over the square root of Rex, and that comes simply from looking at the solution and seeing where 99% of the free stream velocity occurs in terms of our eta parameter. So that's a very useful result. Let's continue to find more of them. Of course, we know that our y values, we can scale eta to get our y values simply by rearranging the definition of eta, and at any given x location, those y values are going to change. That's what's going to bring the, our single curve in terms of our similarity parameter eta into our dimensional form. So what I've done here is I've plotted the velocity profile by scaling f prime, this curve here. So I've selected to use air at 300 Kelvin for this problem, which looking up and looking up for the properties, the kinematic viscosity of air at 300 Kelvin is 15.89 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. I've chosen a free stream velocity of 0.5 meters per second, and if I check, and I'm going to say that transition to turbulence occurs at a critical Reynolds number of 5 times 10 to the 5. If I check that, that means that I will have laminar flow up to 10 meters distance from my leading edge. So I'm going to focus on a region up to that 10 meters, and I'm going to use these properties. Now, I can scale my non-dimensional solution to a dimensional velocity simply by multiplying this f prime by my chosen u infinity. And at any given x location, I can get the corresponding y values from the eta values on this curve here. So if I look at, for example, an x location of 3, I can now determine my dimensional velocity, my dimensional u velocity profile here. I plotted the boundary layer thickness from the equation on the previous slide, and you can see that it intersects my velocity profile right where it should at about 99% of the free stream velocity. As we go to an x value of 6, the y values are different because we have a different x value here for the same eta values, and you can see that this has stretched out this profile, still going from 0 to 0.5 meters per second, which I've shown on the scale here, but now the boundary there is thicker at that point, and so the 99% of the free stream velocity is occurring further out. And finally, going out to an x value of 9, it's stretched out even further in this scaling, and we see that we've recovered the two-dimensional velocity field, or at least the u component of it, by going back through our scaling and looking at our dimensional parameters. Now, I can also look at the v-velocity. We have this equation for the v-velocity, which we derived, um, which relates these scaling parameters to our non-dimensional, to our eta parameter, and now it involves f prime, the non-dimensional velocity distribution, as well as f, the non-dimensional stream function. If I combine those variables, I can look at the v component of the velocity. Now what I've chosen to do here is to look at the v velocity component at the edge of the boundary there. So I've solved for the v velocity component at each point here. Now all I've done in order to do that, x has been my variable, I've put in a delta of 5 because we saw that the edge of the boundary there occurs when delta is equal to 5. And I've plotted this function here and we can see the v velocity at the edge of the boundary there now behaves like this. We can see immediately that the free stream velocity being 0 0.05, that the v velocity are much, much smaller than the u velocities, which is one of our assumptions in the boundary layer equation, so it's good to see that it's been respected. We also see, perhaps not surprisingly, 
there are much bigger changes in the velocity profile early on. Now, as we slow down the fluid close to the wall, of course, the integral of this velocity profile gives me less mass flow than if I integrated the free stream velocity over that same height. And therefore, in order to conserve mass, there has to be a V velocity out of this, uh, outside, out of the boundary there. And this is much stronger at the beginning where the changes are much more rapid. And as we start to see very slow changes in the velocity profiles, that little bit of velocity leaving in order to conserve mass is decreasing. But in all cases, these values are very, very small uh, compared to the U velocity component. We can, of course, put this together into a flow field. And here, what I've done is I have calculated the velocity vector. I've calculated both the U component and the V component everywhere. And I've plotted those velocity vectors over my plate here. So we can see all of these velocity profiles. And of course, in scaling these values, the edge of the boundary there is getting larger and larger. So where I've solved it to, an eta value of 7, corresponds to this value far away from my plate. That's all I've solved for. We don't see more information there. I've also shown a contour plot of the U component of the velocity scaled to this color underneath there. So you can see now everywhere in this field what the U component of the velocity is, and you can see the profiles shown by these vector plots here. And of course you can see it's a nice laminar flow. There's a beautiful stratification of the very slow moving fluid with a layer of the slightly higher moving fluid uh, building on up until we reach U infinity out here outside of the boundary there. Now we can also get information about the shear stress. We want to know the friction coefficient on our plate. Our shear stress is, of course, mu times the velocity gradient at the wall. So we know that our shear stress is going to be uh, decreasing as we move. The velocity gradient is larger here than it is here than it is here, and of course it's larger here as well. I have an expression for du dy that involves my f double prime here. So I can solve for that du dy and get this expression here. I want to evaluate this at the wall, so I need this value, f double prime at eta equals zero, in order to solve for this, in order to account for the velocity gradient at the wall. That is my f double prime of zero. Well, I know that because I had to determine it in order to get this solution correct. That was an initial condition I had to put in, and we solve for that as being 0 .0, 0 0.0.332. So now to get the shear stress, I have to multiply by the viscosity, and I put in my 0.332 for my f double prime. There's an expression for my shear stress. I'd like to non-dimensionalize this and cast it in terms of the friction coefficient. The friction coefficient is nothing other than the shear stress divided by the wall shear stress divided by 1 half rho u infinity squared. Well, I can simplify this further again. I have my 0 0.332. We're dividing by a half, so that's going to double this number. My mu over rho is going to give me a new, a kinematic viscosity. And if I bring that into the square root, I'm going to get a new squared in there, which will cancel out this. I have a velocity here and a velocity squared there, which means that I have a velocity on the denominator. And I can square that and bring it in here. It'll cancel out this and give me a u on the bottom. And so I'll double the constant and be left with the square root of the Reynolds number the square root of the inverse of the Reynolds number, sorry. So my local skin friction coefficient from this solution is 0.664 Reynolds number based on x to the minus 1 half. So I can plot that value very easily as a function of x and see that as we go from near the leading edge, we have a very large value, relatively speaking, of that skin friction coefficient where we have the rapid adjustment of the free stream to the no-slip condition. And as the boundary there grows, we see that gradient getting smaller and smaller and the skin friction coefficient de decreases correspondingly. Of course, I can average that to determine the average skin friction uh, coefficient anywhere from the leading edge to any given point x. And that's simply taking the average, 1 over x times the integral of this value to dx. And we've seen this before. Because this is a function of x to the minus 1 half, uh, what we get is a doubling of that coefficient. We're dividing by the x, but we're integrating this uh, function to the minus 1 half. And so we get that anywhere the average value is double the local value. Well, that's it for the hydrodynamic solution. We can calculate all of our velocity profiles. We can calculate uh, our shear stresses. But now we need to know something about the temperature distribution. So now we have to look at the energy portion of our equation. And again, we'll have to play some trick, the same tricks with the boundary conditions or the initial conditions in order to solve for this one as well, because we have this far field condition instead of an initial condition. So we can go through the exact same process as before. We're going to start two functions now because it's a second order equation. We'll let g0 be g. We need to express it in terms of a derivative. So of course, the derivative of g0 is g prime. We'll follow that chain and say g1 is equal to the derivative of the function I already just did. Uh, g0 prime, and I know that g0 prime is equal to g prime. I need to express this function as the derivative for my solvers, and so the derivative of g1 is then going to be g prime prime. I can go back to my governing equation and solve for what g prime prime is. Of course, g prime prime is minus pr over 2 f times g prime. So now again, I have a closed system where I have 
my two functions that I need to solve for the two things that I wish to know, g and g prime. In order to do it, because of the convective, uh, the con because of the flow, the convective term in my energy equation, I need to know the solution f from my hydrodynamic solution. So, much like before, I can extend my function that I had before. I'm going to call these f's just to make it uh, look more straightforward. So I'm now I'm going to have five functions. The three functions that I had in the hydrodynamic solution, unchanged from before, f0, f1, and f2. And now I'm going to add two more. I'm going to call it f3 to be my g right here. And I'm going to call f4 to be my g prime right here, my g1 function. Well, the first three terms are identical to the hydrodynamic solution. I need to solve this together with my energy equation because of this f appearing in the energy equation solution, because of that uh, the evection terms in the equation. And I can clearly see what these terms should be. My f3 function, which is g, expressed as a derivative, is g prime. And that, of course, is my g1 or my f4 expression. So I have f4 appearing here. And when I solved for the derivative of my g1, which needs to go in this column, I get minus the Prandtl number over 2 times my f, which is my f0, times my g prime, which as we just saw is our f4. So there's the simple function that you need to put in in order to solve this, and we'll have to do the same things with the boundary conditions. So here we're going to look at g is my non-dimensional temperature, that's my f3, and I know that the boundary condition is that my non-dimensional temperature needs to be one far away from the plate. So I'll look at the third column of my solution, which corresponds to g, and I'll look at the last value in it, and I'll say one minus that should be equal to zero. And then I can find my root, use my root, fold, root finder in order to solve for that boundary condition that makes this function zero. And as an example here, I put in a Prandtl number of 100. I'm calling my root solver, looking for this value here. The root solver is finding that root and telling me that for a Prandtl number of 100, the value for g prime at zero that makes the solution correct, that makes it have a non-dimensional temperature of one far away from the plate, satisfies this condition, is a value of 1.571741. I'll have to do this every single time I change the Prandtl number because the, this is a function of the Prandtl number and I'll have to solve this value, which is of course related to my heat flux. It's related to the non-dimensional temperature gradient. This is at the wall, it's at the zero condition, and so this is related to my heat flux for that particular Prandtl number, and it will change with each Prandtl number. Now, let's look at this. I'll pick the same problem that we've done before. The properties are given here. Now I need to specify that I have a, a plate surface temperature. I'll say it's 60 degrees centigrade, and we'll give it T infinity of 20 degrees centigrade. And I'm going to look at a point of x equals 0.5, so relatively early on. And I plotted the temperature profile, now made, made dimensional for three different Prandtl numbers. Prandtl number 0.1, 1, and 10. So let's look at the smallest Prandtl number first. The smallest Prandtl number, of course, starts with a temperature of 60, which is what I asked for. And far away from the plate, it goes to the free stream condition, which is a temperature of 20. In fact, all of them do that, as they need to do, which means that we've solved for the correct boundary condition of 4 g prime in order to get that solution. But this occurs much further away from the plate surface at the lower Prandtl number. When the Prandtl number is 1, that is when we expect the thermal boundary there and the momentum boundary there to be the same size, the edge of that boundary there is down here. At a Prandtl number of 0.1, it's way out here. And as we go to higher Prandtl numbers, it gets even closer to the surface of the plate. So the edge of the boundary there is perhaps here for that case. So we can look over a range of Prandtl numbers and look for that point where the non-dimensional temperature is 0.99. And if we do that, we can plot this as a function of Prandtl numbers. So what I've done here is looked at Prandtl numbers from 0.6 all the way up to 100, and I've solved for that solution, got the correct boundary condition from that root solver, and I know that the edge of my momentum boundary there is at an eta value of 5. Well, I've solved for where the non-dimensional temperature, what is the eta value for the, for the non-dimensional temperature to be 0.99, and I've divided those two, so the 5 represents the thickness of the momentum boundary there, and the eta for the thermal boundary there uh, represents the thickness of the thermal boundary there. So that's my blue function, and it shows me how the ratio of the momentum boundary there and the thermal boundary there behave from a Prandtl number of 0.6 up to 100. Now I'm comparing that with the function Prandtl number to the one-third. That's the yellow x's. And you can see that there's excellent agreement for the ratio of these boundary there's being equal to Prandtl number to the one-third. And so I can extract from this 
I have a numerical solution. I've investigated where the edge of the thermal boundary there is. I've compared it with the edge of the momentum boundary there. And what I see is that delta, the momentum boundary there thickness over the thermal boundary there thickness, fits very, very well with the function Prandtl number to the one third. And so this is where we see this term appearing in many of our correlations as the Prandtl number scales that thickness of the thermal boundary there compared to the momentum boundary there. And correspondingly, the gradient in the temperature profile compared to the gradient in the velocity profile. Now what I would like to do is find a correction so that I can calculate uh, my convection coefficient or my Nusselt number, more particularly my Nusselt number. Now I know that in the case of the momentum solution, the second derivative of f at the wall, which is related, sorry, which is related to my skin friction, it's related to my shear stress, was equal to 0 0.332. So what I'm looking at here is what's the value that we solved in order to make these solutions for g prime, which is related to the temperature gradient. And if I look at g prime of zero, I'm looking at something that's related to the temperature gradient at the wall, which of course is related to the heat transfer from the solid into the fluid. So plotting that value here, g prime of zero, or something that's related uh, to the non-dimensional temperature gradient at the wall, uh, compared to the function 0 0.332 Prandtl number to the one-third. So I know the corresponding value in the hydrodynamic solution is 0 0.332. I know that the thermal boundary there scales with the momentum boundary there as a function of Prandtl number to the one-third. So perhaps this boundary, this value that I'm looking for, might scale with the value from the hydrodynamic solution with this function Prandtl number to the one-third. And so I plotted this also from a value of 0.6 Prandtl number all the way up to 100, and we see that there's very good agreement. It gets slightly less good agreement as we get to these higher uh, Prandtl numbers, but it's still very good agreement. And that means that using 0.332 times the Prandtl number to the one-third, I will be able to determine what is this value, or I'll be able to correlate the results in order to show what ultimately what the Nusselt number is. So let's do that. So we know that the first derivative of g is my value of the gradient of the non-dimensional temperature profile with respect to eta at the surface. And I can see, or I will say, that that fits very well to this function 0.332 pr to the one-third. Now I just need to scale this using the scaling parameters and come up with what the Nusselt number is. So if g prime of zero is this, which I'm going to say fits very well to 0.332 Prandtl number to the one-third, knowing that it's not perfect as we go to the higher uh, Prandtl numbers. So here's my expression for the non-dimensional temperature gradient at the wall with respect to y. And the Reynolds number, in, in looking at the Reynolds number as we move across our plate, the length scale that we're using is x. And so if I think about non-dimensionalizing y, this may look a little bit funny, but it is correct because we're using the length scale x. So if I think about a non-dimensional y, that y should be y over x with this choice of length scale, which means that x times my non-dimensional differential in y will be equal to dy. If I plug this into here, dy is equal to x times dy star, I will get this expression here. And this, of course I can simplify, if I square this x and bring it in, I find I have the Reynolds number to the one half here. So my non-dimensional temperature profile at the wall is approximately equal to 0.332 Reynolds number to the one half times Prandtl number to the one third. Now if you remember, the non-dimensional temperature gradient at the wall is by definition the Nusselt number. And so we have just determined to a good approximation that the Nusselt number as a function of x across our plate, the local Nusselt number, is 0.332 Reynolds number to the one half, Prandtl number to the one third. Now we can use that in order to calculate the local convection coefficient. We've just had this expression here. I'll drop the approximately equal to. It's our correlation. It's valid for Prandtl numbers greater than 0.6, and probably we should limit it to Prandtl numbers of 100. As you can see, it's starting to disagree uh, noticeably by that point. But the Nusselt number is equal to hx over k with this choice of length scale. And so let's solve for h, and let's look how the Nusselt number varies. So solving uh, for the Nusselt number, my h of x is going to be this expression here, and we'll see that it varies with an x to the minus 1 half. Well, I can pull out my conductivity for this flow for air at 300 Kelvin, and I can evaluate this convection coefficient for these conditions that I have here. And if I plot that now for my three Prandtl numbers, I can see that in all cases it's high near the leading edge, where the temperature gradient is large, where we go from T infinity to Ts very abruptly, and it gets smaller, this, this gradient gets smaller as we move into the flow, and that's, that's reflected here. And we also see the variation with the Prandtl number. When the Prandtl number is high, that means that the thermal boundary there is smaller compared to the momentum boundary there, 
then not surprisingly, this gradient is even bigger. We're squashing this whole thing down by having a higher Prandtl number, and so we see higher convection coefficients. When we go to a Prandtl number that's lower than a Prandtl number of 1, the opposite is true. The thermal boundary there is getting larger, this gradient is getting smaller, and our local convection coefficient is smaller than in the case of the Prandtl number of 1. We can, of course, look at the average coefficients, and you can see again we have this function of the x to the minus 1 half. So when I integrate this x to the minus 1 half, I'm going to find that I get a, and I'm dividing by x as part of my definition of the average, I'm going to find that the average value is everywhere twice the local value at that point. So the average from the leading edge to any point is twice the local value at that given point. And that means that my average convection coefficient is 0.664 times this expression, x to the minus one half pr to the minus one third. And now to make this usable, I want to put this back in terms of a Nusselt number, so it doesn't depend upon my particular material properties. So putting in the definition of the Nusselt number being the average convection coefficient x over k, multiply by this x, bring it in here, and we see that we have the Reynolds number to the one half appearing again, and we have this doubling of the constant. So my Nusselt number average at any point in my laminar boundary layer flow is 0.664 rex to the one half prandtl to the one third, and we didn't look at any values of the Prandtl number lower than 0.6, and so we better not extend it to any values lower than that. Likewise, we should be cautious about going very high in the Prandtl number as we see the solution is getting less and less in agreement with this expression, 0.332 PR to the one third, as we go to higher Prandtl number. So to summarize our solutions, we have the hydrodynamic solution that was able to give us the thickness of the boundary there at any x location. It was able to tell us a lot about the uh, relationship between the thickness of the momentum boundary there and the thermal boundary there. We calculated the local skin friction coefficient and the average skin friction coefficient, and of course we're able to calculate the velocity x and y component at any location within our boundary there. From the energy equation, we were able to determine the Nusselt number, the local value, and from the Nusselt number we can get our convection, local convection coefficient, and of course we can average that to get the average value for a plate of any dimension we wish to use.